Uh, good afternoon. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Danny Van Wick from Dartmouth College. So uh, he and me, we are both going to, to give this mini course. So he's going to talk for the first two days, and then we're going to talk about the, uh, the other two days on groupoid algebras. And we're going to talk about a little bit about left path algebras during the this course of the period. So there's going to be a little bit of intersection with Leah's uh, talk uh, in the morning. So we are hoping that uh, we see a, a different approach for the left path algebras on, on, on using groupoids. So it's, a, it's supposed to be an introductory course. So I hope you, you enjoy it. And uh, whenever you have any questions, you can, you can ask. So, yeah. yeah, thank you, Julius. Um, yeah, can everybody hear me okay? Is it too loud, too soft? Is it all right? Okay, so first of all, thank you to the organizers for um, for allowing me to give the talk and, and, and being part of this uh, conference. Uh, so as Julie said, I want to talk about group words and I'll be talking today and tomorrow. So the first part is just an introduction to group words and tomorrow part two will be uh, on group word algebras, in particular Steinberg algebras. And I intended it really as a very, very introductory course and I hope that it, uh, uh, that it falls into that category and um, please by all means if you have questions or comments um, you're more than welcome to chip in and, and ask or, or, or leave a comment uh, if you want to or if anything is unclear okay okay so uh, I'm not going to delve too much into the history of group words group words has been around for quite a while uh, the way we use group words um, uh, in other words uh, constructing algebras from them and, and studying those algebras in a big way started with John Renault uh, when he constructed a C star algebra from a topological group word. Um, I think for us, we should just jump straight into the definition of a group word. And um, for those of you who are familiar with a group, uh, you can view a group word as a generalization of a group. And the way it generalizes a group is that. Uh, we don't necessarily have the operation defined for all pairs of elements. And that has quite a few consequences. But we do want an operation, and we do want the operation to satisfy the usual axioms of a group when it makes sense. OK, so to that end, uh, for a group word, we'll start with some set G. And then we'll start with, we'll also require a subset of the Cartesian product of G by itself, which we call the composable pairs. So these are the pairs for which the operation is valid. Uh, we require a map from G2 into G that takes a pair gamma eta to the product gamma eta, and we call this multiplication. Uh, we also require an inverse map, so taking any gamma in G to an element which we denote by gamma to the power minus one. All right, the term inverse will become apparent uh, once we talk about the properties, the axioms that they need to satisfy. Okay, so here comes the axioms. We need the following conditions to be satisfied. So we need the inverse map to be an involution, meaning that if we take an element gamma, it's inverse is inverse is the element itself, right? Associativity. So here we need to be a little bit careful because multiplication might not be defined for all elements. So suppose we've got two pairs of composable pairs, gamma and eta. So in other words, the product gamma eta is allowed and eta delta. So delta eta is allowed then we would require that gamma eta comma delta is also a composable pair and similarly gamma and the product eta delta is also a composable pair and when we have this instance then we have our usual associativity that we're used to from groups okay identities for any element in the group weight gamma we require that gamma and its inverse be a composable pair. And you can reverse the order as well, right? By the first property, the involution, you can reverse the order. So we require gamma, gamma inverse to be composable, and we also require gamma inverse, gamma to be composable. 
And when we find products involving gamma, gamma inverse, then we would like it to act as an identity. So for example, over here, uh, I'm so used to my fingers pointing. Let me try this laser. So over here, we've got gamma eta, and we multiply from the right by eta inverse. So this pair, eta, eta inverse, we want that to act as an identity. So we only get gamma back out of that. Also, if we multiply with gamma inverse on the left-hand side, then gamma inverse gamma should act as an identity and just give us back eta. Okay, so these are the axioms of a group weight. Um, and usually there's some maps that we also associate with the group weight. The first is a range map. So the range of any gamma is defined as gamma, gamma inverse. The way to look at this will become a little bit more apparent and easy once we, uh, once we view these elements as little arrows. But before we get there, let's just get these definitions out of the way. So similarly, we define a source map. And the source of gamma is defined as gamma inverse times gamma. So it's just the other way around. And then this is another big difference between a group weight and a group. So in a group, we have an identity element, and the identity element is unique. There's only one of them. However, for every single group weight element gamma, the element gamma inverse and gamma acts as an identity in the appropriate sense. So we have a whole set of units in this case, and we call that the unit space and denoted by G naught. Okay. So, we have a little lemma that we can write. All the, uh, some of the algebraic properties that we used to for, uh, for groups, like cancellation, etc., is also valid for group words, once again, when it makes sense. So, uh, first of all, if we choose any gamma in the group word, then we require that the range of gamma and gamma be a composable pair. And we also re require that gamma and the source of gamma be a composable pair. And when we multiply those, they leave gamma uh, unchanged because the range of gamma is just a unit. Right. And the same for the source, right? Source of gamma is just a unit that's being multiplied on the right-hand side, so we should get gamma back by our identity uh, axiom. All right, so let's take a composable pair gamma eta. And it turns out that we can prove that the gamma and eta is a composable pair if and only if the source of gamma is equal to the range of eta. So in other words, the set of all composable pairs are those pairs, gamma, eta, for which the source of gamma is equal to the range of gamma. And that's a really handy property uh, when one does computations with, uh, with group weight elements. Uh, the range and the source of any unit leaves the unit unchanged. All right, so any u, uh, the range it gives me u back. The source also gives me u back. Okay. All right, so here's a helpful way to visualize groupoid elements. Uh, it is common to visualize a groupoid element as some arrow having some starting point, its source, and some terminal point, its range. So gamma denotes this arrow. So now you can imagine if we consider the range of gamma was defined as uh, gamma, gamma inverse. And that's because we read products from the right to the left. So if we first run along gamma inverse and then back along gamma, then we're at the range of gamma. So that's a nice way to work with these products. Let's look at multiplication in a more uh, general setting, not for a single element. So here we have three group weight elements. We've got delta, gamma, and eta. And you'll note that gamma and eta are composable, but delta is not composable with either gamma or eta. Gamma and eta are composable, but they're only composable in a very specific order because the source of eta is equal to the range of gamma. So we can multiply them in the form eta, gamma. And what we end up with is this red little arrow with range, the same range as eta, and source, the same source as gamma. 
All right, so in, 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 in essence, it's almost like concatenation of paths. All right, oopsie. All right, so some more structural notions. Um, I don't think they'll play a big part, but they are really prominent features of group words, especially if you view a group word uh, as a generalization of some dynamical system, um, which I, for example, and my colleagues uh, often do. So the isotropic group, so let's fix a specific unit U in the unit space. Then the isotropic group at U are all the group weight elements that have range and source map equal to U, right? So GU is a bona fide group. It's an actual group in the true sense of what we mean by a group. So for every single unit, you can consider the isotropy group. And whether the isotropy groups are trivial, non-trivial, or what their topology is, uh, plays a big part in, 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 the, in the behavior of, of many of the group weights and the properties that they have. So this is the, the, the pictorial view. Here we have gamma. The range and source is equal, so all elements out of the isotropy groups look like this. They're little loops based at a unit. Okay. The orbit of U. So again, U is some unit in the unit space. The orbit of U are all the units. So suppose we've got U and we've got a V. If there is some group weight um, uh, element gamma that connects U with V, then V is in the orbit of U. Right. So all gamma such that I think I, oops, there we go. All gamma such that the range of gamma is equal to V and the source of gamma is U. Okay, is that all right? Any questions, comments? Fine. Okay, so I'm going to look at a couple of examples a couple of times. Uh, I've got about three, four or five examples in mind, so we'll look at those now. We'll introduce some more structure, then we'll revisit them. And tomorrow, when we look at group word algebras, we'll revisit them once again. Okay, so the first one is a group. Every group is a group weight with the group operations. Uh, and the unit space in this case is just the group identity, and it's a singleton. Okay, so that's sort of a, a trivial case in a way. Uh, uh, that should have been a pause, I suppose, but. A group word is a group if and only if the unit space is a singleton. Okay, so uh, that, that characterizes group words that are groups. So here's an interesting one as well. Let's fix some natural number n. And then we look at the set from 1 to n Cartesian product with itself. So it's all pairs of integers from 1 to n. Uh, Let's define the composable pairs as all those elements i, j, and k, l, such that j and k, those two innermost integers, are equal. And when that's the case, we define multiplication as just the, uh, uh, just the pair given by i and l, so the two outer, the first, and the, the, the last one. Inverses just reverses the order. And then Rn is a group weight. And there's actually nothing special about this group weight because this is a special case of uh, something much more general, uh, namely equivalence relations. So if you take any set, any set, right, and you have an equivalence relation defined on this set, then in the same way as in the previous slide, we define the composable pairs x, y, w, z, if and only if y is equal to w. And multiplication, in this instance, uh, of x, y by y, z just gives us x, z. So it's exactly the same as the previous slide, right? Inverse, uh, inverses reverses the order. And then R is a group weight. And let's, uh, let's have a look at what the range and the source maps do. So the range map is defined as this. Now you can reverse the order of this uh, the spare x, y, which leaves you with y, x. The two y's disappear, and you're left with x, x. For the source, it works sort of the other way around. Here, we reverse the order of those two, and then we're left with y, x. So the two x's disappear, and we're left with y, y. So what do we end up with? It means that the unit space of this group weight is the set of all pairs x, x, such that x is in x. 
And it's common in the literature to say that we identify the unit space with X. Uh, this, this word identify created a little bit of confusion for me when I started out with groupoids. I, I don't think it's always made clear, but whenever there's some extra structure involved, identify means that uh, they are identified with that structure. So if they're topological spaces, it means they're homeomorphic. If they're algebraic, uh, some, if there's some algebraic structure, then that structure is preserved as well. Okay. All right, so here are two extreme cases. If you take the set X Cartesian product with itself, so in other words, every two elements are equivalent to each other, then that is a groupoid, which shows that the, the class of groupoids includes sets. That's fairly general. In fact, maybe a little bit too general, right? And, and for that reason, we'll introduce some extra structure in a moment. Another extreme case is if we take the set X and X is only equivalent to itself. So that's sort of the diagonal, right? Um, then this is also a group weight. Okay, so let's dig a little bit deeper into this equivalence relation group weights. Suppose we've got two group weights, H and G, and a map phi from H to G. Then phi is called a group weight homomorphism. If it takes composable pairs in G, to composable pairs in H, and it preserves the algebraic operation, multiplication, right? So there's two aspects. We need to take composable pairs to composable pairs, and then uh, multiplication is preserved. If, in addition, phi is bijective and its inverse is also a group weight homomorphism, then we call it uh, phi a group weight isomorphism. All right, so. Why the fuss? Consider the following equivalence relation, RG. So we look at all pairs for any gamma. We look at the pair range gamma, source gamma. That defines an equivalence relation on the unit space of the group weight, right? So in other words, you can think of the orbits we defined a little bit earlier. V is in the orbit of U if there's some gamma connecting them, right? So translating it into this language would mean that uh, those two units are equivalent. And the map taking gamma to the range of gamma, source of gamma, is surjective, and it's a group weight homomorphism from G into R. So we say that G is a principal group weight if this map is injective. Right. And now we've got a characterization of uh, equivalence relation group weights. G is algebraically isomorphic to an equivalence relation if and only if G is principal. So, in fact, our principal group weights are exactly the equivalence relation group weights. Okay. Um, and if you start off with G, the equivalence relation to which it is iso algebraically isomorphic is exactly this RG. Okay. All right. Here's another one that's sort of... Uh, that I find very interesting. Uh, that's dynamical systems. So suppose you've got a group H and it acts on a set by bijection. So that means we've got a map that takes a group element and it gives you some bijection on the set. And you can compose them uh, and that preserves the group operation. Right, so let G be the set of all triples where X and Y are in X and G is one of the group elements. But we require that X is equal to the action of G on Y. Okay. Then we can define multiplication, very similar to the uh, equivalence relation, only difference being now we multiply the two group elements in the middle. So the Y still falls away, but we times G and H. Uh, inverses are defined again. We reverse the order, but we also now take the uh, group uh, inverse in the middle for the second co coordinate. Then G is a groupoid, and the range of any element of the form X, G, Y is just X, group identity X. The source is Y, group identity Y, which means we can identify the unit space of the groupoid with X. 
the space uh, on which H acts. All right. Um, this particular groupoid is sometimes called a transformation groupoid uh, because uh, the action of a topological group in the topical space is often referred to as a transformation group, and the groupoid we get from that is then the transformation groupoid. And what's really interesting about this is that this groupoid encodes many of the structural properties of the uh, dynamical system. For example, orbits in the dynamical system correspond to orbits in the groupoid. Isotropy groups in the uh, dynamical system correspond to isotropy groups in the uh, groupoid. Uh, same for the orbit spaces. So this is a, a really handy way to study uh, dynamical systems uh, and generalize them as well. Okay, here's another example that um, will probably feature quite a few times in this uh, conference because of uh, uh, levitt path algebras. So suppose E is a directed graph. Uh, what do we mean by that? It means that E0 is a set of vertices, E1 is a set of edges, and we have two maps from the edges into the vertices called the range and the source maps. The direct analog of the little arrows we saw earlier, right? For example, here we have a direct graph, two vertices, U and V, two edges, E and F, the source of E is U, the range of E is V, and that's also equal to both the source and the range of the edge F. Okay, so it's tempting to just use this sort of concatenation of paths to get a groupoid, right? Similar to how a groupoid is defined. We have we have this little arrow picture, so why not just say we mul define multiplication whenever we can, uh, whenever we have the range equal to the source of two paths, and we can con concatenate them and then run along the whole path. Unfortunately, for the purposes of studying um, algebras associated to graphs and, 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 and showing that those algebras are isomorphic, we need a slightly different group way to work with. So let's introduce some more terminology. Uh, a path of length n is a finite sequence of edges such that the range of any EI must be equal to the source of the edge following it. And we'll let E star denote all finite paths. Um, any vertex is considered as a path of length zero. And an infinite path is an infinite sequence of um, edges such that the range of any particular edge is equal to the source of the edge following it in this sequence. All right, one more. Given any finite path x, we'll denote by x e1 all the edges that are emitted from the range of x. So imagine we've got some path x, and there's the range of x. There might be multiple edges leaving this uh this range this range vertex all of those edges leaving the range vertex that's what we denote by oops by this x e1 okay then we can define the boundary path space so this is defined as the union of three sets let's uh let's tackle them one by one so the first is we require all infinite paths to be in the boundary path space the second set says that there are no, uh, this includes all the so-called sinks. So whenever you have a finite path that ends in a vertex, let's say V, then V emits no edges. There's nothing that leaves V. Those are your sinks. And then on the other extreme, if you have a finite path ending in a vertex V, then there may be infinitely many path, uh, edges, I beg your pardon, leaving that vertex. We call such a vertex an infinite emitter. And these three sets together form the boundary path space of a uh, graph. Okay, now we can define the groupoid, finally. So the groupoid is defined as follows. We consider all paths, all triples, where the first and the third coordinates are paths of the form alpha x, beta x. Both need to be in the boundary path space. And 
we also require x without the alpha and without the beta to be in the boundary path space. And alpha and beta are just two random, well, I suppose not random, but two finite paths that satisfy these conditions, right? Uh, in the middle, we have an integer. And it's common, there's, there's a variation on this definition where uh, you can just say we look at int integers of the form m minus n, but then you need to introduce a, a shift map of, of sorts. And uh, we might include an exercise of that type on Friday for you guys to, uh, to play around with. Okay. In this instance, the integer is determined by the length of the path alpha minus the length of the path beta. And now, same as with the equivalence relation and the transformation groupoid, we can define uh, operations as follows. X, K, Y, only multiplied by something with a Y there. Let's say Y, L, Z. The Ys disappear. We keep the X, we keep the Z, and then we add the two integers because that's the uh, Z is a, a group with addition, so we indicate it with addition. Inversion, similar. We reverse the order, and then we take the additive inverse of K. And then G is a group weight. GE is a group weight. The range of any X, K, Y is just X, 0, X. Source of any X, K, Y is Y, 0, Y. So can you guess? Yes, we identify the unit space of the group weight with the boundary path space. Okay. All right. So before we get there, any questions, comments? So I hope these examples at least convince you that group words are pretty versatile. They're, they're, they're fairly general objects. In fact, it looks like we can associate the group word with almost anything. And that's not necessarily a good thing, right? You don't want an object that's so general that every property holds for it. You'd like to be able to study it a little. So let's introduce some more structure. Uh, we want to give the group weight a topology uh, such that the topology is compatible with the algebraic structure of the group weight. All right, so we'll call G a topological group weight if it is a group weight with a locally compact topology such that the unit space is Hausdorff in the relative topology. So Remember, we're viewing the unit space as a subset of the group weight itself. That's not always the case. Some people prefer not to do that, especially in a categorical sense. But for us, the unit space will be a subset of the group weight. So if that is Hausdorff in the relative topology and G as a locally compact topology, then it's a topological group weight. But we also require multiplication to be continuous. And we require the inverse map to be a continuous map. Okay. Because multiplication and inverse is continuous, each of them, it follows that the range and the source maps are continuous, right? Because the range and the source maps are both just products of gamma with its inverse. Okay. Many group weights of interest are Hausdorff. The majority of the group weights that I, for example, work with are Hausdorff group weights, and that's where my interest lies. But there are many important examples of non-Hausdorff group weights, um, which make them attractive to study uh, in their own right. So there's a reference. I suppose this reference doesn't mean much to you uh, as it stands. But at the end, you can have a look at this. Uh, this is a reference of work done by Rui Excel. Um, he's done a little bit on, uh, well, quite a bit on uh, non-Hausdorff group weights, okay? In this talk, I will only consider Hausdorff group weights. And then we have a lemma. When is a group weight Hausdorff? Well, a group weight is Hausdorff if and only if the unit space is closed in G. So I didn't say it earlier, but every now and then I might give a little result like this, and I encourage anybody who's interested in it and, and, and to whom this is new, um, to get the slides off the internet and see if you can prove these results. Right, they're not uh, supposed to be uh, super complicated, but they are really instructive. It, it helps you sort of get used to uh, to these group points. 
Okay. Now, we've got topological groupoids, and let's specialize a little bit further. Where we want to get to etal and eventually to ample groupoids. So a function from, two, from a topological space X to a topological space Y is called a local homeomorphism if the function is continuous. And for every X, there is an open neighborhood such that the image of this neighborhood is open in the target space. And if restricted to this uh, open set U is a homeomorphism onto each, its image. Um, then we call a groupoid etal if the range map is a local homeomorphism. I didn't write it down, but uh, if the range map is a local homeomorphism, then so is the source map. Okay. Right, so suppose G is etal. Uh, then we call a subset of G a bisection if there is some open set containing this set B, such that the range map and the source map restricted to this open set U uh, is a homeomorphism onto some open subset of the unit space. And then finally, G is an ample group word if it is an etal group word and it has a basis of compact open bisections. This is super important uh, for ample group words. It's essentially what makes everything work the way it works. All right. All right. So, I won't have much more to say about ample group words today except for the examples. Uh, let's just delve into etal group words a little bit, some of the structure that they have. So if G is an etal group word, then the unit space is open. So remember that we know that if, if the group word is Hausdorff, then the unit space is closed. But there's no reason why the unit space should be open. For every etal group word, it turns out that the unit space is open. And the pre-image of any unit under either the range or the source map is a discrete set. Okay. So we've got the following proposition. Um, suppose G is a Hausdorff group weight and that the unit space is open. Then the following are equivalent. G is an etal group weight. Range and source maps are local homeomorphisms. Okay, wow, that's not saying much. That's how we defined it. Nonetheless, uh, here is a new one. The range is an, the range map is an open map. Equivalently, the source map is an open map. And if you want to construct not Steinberg algebras, but uh, C star algebras from an etal group weight, then this is actually a very, very important property because this allows you, uh, this implies that the existence of, of, of some kind of measure or actually a system of measures from which you can construct uh, the algebra. And another equivalent condition is that G has a basis of open bisections for its topology. Okay, all of them are uh, super handy. Back to some examples. How am I doing for time? Well, I'm pretty good. Okay, so every locally compact group is a topological group weight, all right? Turns out that in this case, uh, the group is an etal group weight if and only if the group is discrete. So in other words, etal group weights generalize discrete groups. What about equivalence relations? Well, if X is a locally compact space and we've got some equivalence relation R on X, then R is a topological group weight if we give it the relative product topology on uh, the Cartesian product of X by itself. Group actions. Okay. So recall that uh, this was the group weight for a group H acting on some set X. Now, if we impose structure on the group, we require the group to be a locally compact Hausdorff group. And it acts on a locally compact Hausdorff space, this time not by bijections, but by homeomorphisms. Then this is a topological group weight with respect to the relative product topology, the product topology coming from X times H times X. All right. When's it etal? Well, the group weight is etal if and only if the acting group is a discrete group. So, etal group weights 
not only generalize discrete groups, they actually generalize discrete group actions. If we have that X has a basis of compact open sets, then it turns out that G is an ample group weight. Okay. Uh, all right, so let's get back to the directed graph. So here, once again, we need to do a little bit of work because uh, the graph group weight was defined as some subset of the Cartesian product of the boundary path space by the integers by the boundary path space. So our first ta task will be to give the boundary path space a topology. All right. So let's take some finite path mu and all the edges that are emitted from the range of mu let's take a finite subset from those edges then we define the cylinder set of u as all the boundary paths that begin with u so any boundary path which starts with u and then carries on and does something whatever something else that's in the cylinder set of um, mu uh, we define the punctured cylinder set as all elements in the cylinder set of Z, uh, uh, sorry, of mu, except for those boundary paths that start with something from the set F, the finite set that we started off with. All right, so let me give you just a little uh, illustrative example. So here we have um some directed graph we've got mu and then we've got some infinite path x we've got some infinite path y so the cylinder set of mu in this instance would be well mu x it's an infinite path so that would be in the boundary path space and so too would mu y be in the boundary path space right so the cylinder set in this instance is the pair mu x mu y now let's consider the punctured cylinder set where uh, this Y1 denotes the very first term in the sequence that's determined by Y. So Y is an infinite sequence of edges, right? So the very first, uh, very first edge, let that be Y. So if we consider the punctured set, then Y1 or any path following Y1 is not allowed. So the only one that's left is mu X. And it turns out that these sets form a basis of compact open sets for a locally, not a KO compact, but a compact Hausdorff topology on the boundary path space. Okay. All right. And these are the guys that we want to use in our uh, description of a topology for the graph group weight. So let's see how that works. I think I might actually finish very soon. All right. Using the cylinder sets, we want to define a topology. So let's fix two finite paths, mu and nu. And let's assume that they have the same range. So we've got two finite paths and they end in the same vertex. So from that vertex, you can now have a bunch of infinite paths leaving, right? They will all be in the cylinder of mu. They will all be in the cylinder of nu. So we define Z mu nu as the set of all triples where the first one is a boundary path of the form mu x. The third coordinate is a boundary path of the form nu x. And as usual, the second coordinate is the integer obtained by taking the length of mu minus the length of nu. All right. And we can define a sort of uh, uh, analog of the punctured cylinder for the group void. Again, same definition. The only difference is this time, instead of taking mu x as any element in the cylinder set, cylinder set, now it must be in the punctured cylinder set. And the same for nu x. It must be in the punctured cylinder set. Then these sets form a basis of compact open bisections for a locally compact Hausdorff topology on the graph group weight, uh, making the graph group weight an ample group weight. Okay, so 
I told myself that I would be really, really slow. It turns out I wasn't. So there are some references. Uh, the first one is uh, a paper by Rui Excel where he studies non-Hausdorff uh, group weights, if you would like to have a look at that. All three of the other references, I don't know why they came out in this order. There's no reason for this particular order. John Renault uh, initiated the study of group weight C star algebra. So although there's a lot of content in that book, and a lot of it is about C star algebras, the first part of the book um, should be uh, really accessible just to get an idea of group weights and examples of group weights. Um, I believe this book by Aidan Sims and Zabo and Williams is also nice. This is actually a book that's uh, got three parts. I think you would likely only be interested in the second part by Aidan Sims. Um, and his focus, once again, is mostly uh, Ital group weight C star algebras. Uh, but there's a nice introduction that uh, that you can also go over if this if this interests you. And then finally, uh, there's also a book by Dana Williams, Toolkit for Group Weight C-Star Algebras, as the title suggests. Um, the main goal in that book is to study Group Weight C-Star Algebras, and in particular, their representation theory. But again, the first, uh, I guess, first section or three uh, would be a really nice reference to, to, uh, to learn about group weight. Okay, so that's just about everything I think I had to say for today. Any questions, comments? Anything that you uh, would like to know? Well, I have one. Yes. Uh, so Leah did today in the morning a few examples of Levit five algebras. One I think was just two arrows, but one there was like the infinite dimensional algebra, which was just one arrow and then a loop. Right. And so she just listed the elements is infinite dimensional, right? So every time there's a loop, the algebra is infinite dimensional. So you have right E and F, and then you have F, F square, F cube, and you know. so could would it be possible maybe to describe the path group, the boundary path space in the groupoid for a simple example like this? Maybe list the elements because we know um you should be able to do it, yes. Uh so I mean, hmm. You want to write the board? I mean, yeah. Let's see. So, for example, let's think. Uh, so, let's say. Is this big enough? Can, can everyone see this? So, suppose we've got something there. Yeah, well, it was even simpler. Uh, her even example simpler. is just one loop. We, just and one, one edge loop. getting into the loop. Right. So I think I'm going to do this one because I don't think it, it, it makes it much more complicated. It just adds a little other dimension, I suppose. So with this thing, there's no sinks, right? So we don't have any vertices that just end in that. We don't have any sinks, and we don't have any infinite emitters. So we don't have anything of that kind either. Um, so let's. First of all, name them. So let's say we have E, F, H. Oh, can I help? Is this fine? Okay, so what do we want out of this? Let's think. So the boundary path space. In this instance, because we don't have any sinks or any Infinite emitters will just be the infinite paths, right? So let's start. Let's see if we can label them. So first of all, note that this loop ends in this vertex, and then we can follow this edge, and we can also then get stuck in this loop. Once you're in this loop, you're going nowhere. So I suppose we could have something of the form E n minus 1 f h where n ranges over the natural number. So in particular, when n is 1, then that disappears. It means we're just following f, and then we get stuck in the loop. Or, I suppose we need an infinite there, right? Or we could just have h infinite, infinitely times in that loop. 
or for any, in, uh, any natural number greater than one, it means you can run along E as many times as you like, and then follow F, and then you get stuck in the loop. So I think those are two elements. And then what else can we have? Any suggestions? Right, just E, just running along E the whole time. So we can just take E and then we get stuck in there for, for an infinite number of cycles. Uh, do you think that there's anything else? I think that's about it, right? Do you agree? Uh, I don't see anything else. So what's interesting here is uh, we actually, I did some work on this example recently, and you can talk about uh, convergence here as well. So you can maybe go and have a look at those cylinder sets. So for example, let's consider the cylinder set of, uh, what about just F? Any ideas? What can we include in, in, in this set? So first of all, what are the cylinder sets? So the cylinder set of a finite path are all the boundary paths that start with that finite path, right? So surely we should include F and then H infinity. Anything else? No. Uh, there isn't anything else there. How about this one? This is a little bit different, right? So we're essentially running along E once, twice. <clears throat> Excuse me. What are our options here? Well, we know we have to start with E. Two first, we need to do the finite path and then all possible infinite paths from that point on. So, for example, we could have E2 and then E infinity, which is just E infinity, or we could have E2 and then E n minus one F H. Ooh. Thank you. H infinity. Right. And you can also start talking about convergence because if you look at this path, right, for every single uh, natural number, we get a different boundary path. But they're indexed by the natural. So you actually have a sequence of boundary paths. Where would they converge to? I mean, there's N gets bigger and bigger and bigger, what happens? So what happens if we look at the limit as n goes to infinity of e n minus one if h infinity. Just e infinity, right? And uh, I'm not going to work this out, but you can go and see, if you look at the group weight, see if you can show that uh, E infinity is not in the same orbit as this element, which means the closure of this orbit contains this element. So there are only two orbits, one of which is dense in the unit space. Okay. Any other questions? So these things are really fun to play with. I really encourage you to uh, play around with some of the propositions and the lemmas uh, and graphs. Graphs make the subject so much more accessible because you can draw pictures and you can list the actual boundary paths. Uh, and that, that gives a lot of insight. Okay. Thank you very much for listening. And tomorrow we'll construct some algebras. That'll be nice. <laughs>